Amen. All right. It's funny. Uh, I had a, a operation, have a cataract removed from my eye this last uh, week before last, wherever it was. That's why I wasn't here this last Sunday. But you know, leading up to that, my vision in this one eye was getting so bad that I mean, I had to like get down like this to to read, even with my glasses on, because my uh, vision was changing so rapidly because of that. And now. I can see far really good, but I have to wait about three or four weeks to get glasses so that I can read, so I can see things up close. So now, instead of like this, now I have to go back like this. So it's kind of a weird, you know, radical trends, you know, change that I have to do with my thinking. A lot of times I can't read something. I was like, no, that's making it worse. It's like, oh. So, so I have a really big print today on my tablet for me to be able to see. But beginning, we're in our uh, Bible study through the letter of Hebrews, if you'll remember. And we're in Hebrews 11, and we're still in verse 32. We'll be there for two or three more weeks, actually. But in Hebrews 11.32 it says, And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets. There are six people from Bible history that are mentioned by name as examples of faith here in this verse. And we've looked at the first two of those people, Gideon and Barak. And today we're going to look at the third person, look at the story of Samson. Samson was a unique character. There were none like him before or after. He was God's terminator, sent to deliver the people of Israel from their enemy, the Philistines. And Samson was a man of extremes. He is one of the most dynamic and awe-inspiring people in the whole Bible. He is also one of the most tragic people in the Bible. His physical strength and power are legendary, but his character weaknesses are equally legendary, especially his uncontrollable attraction to beautiful women. He was gifted with tremendous supernatural physical strength, enabling him to conquer literally any foe and render himself almost indestructible And yet he was unable to control himself, which was his downfall. Proverbs 25, 28 says, Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. In the ancient world, a walled city was nearly impossible for an enemy to get into. But a city without walls was completely defenseless against the assault of an enemy. And in the same way, a person without self-control is defenseless against temptation and self-indulgence. And this was Samson. With his great strength, he could kill a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey, but his lack of self-control allowed a single woman to make him into a donkey. Well, the story of Samson begins in Judges chapter 13, and that's where we begin our study this morning, Judges chapter 13. And the first verse says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. The word again has such an ominous ring to it in the book of Judges. The Israelites once again have turned away from the Lord and began to worship the pagan gods and indulge in the sinful practices of the people around them. So the Lord allows the Philistines to oppress them for 40 years, the longest period of enemy oppression in the book of Judges. In the verse 2 it says, A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you're going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. 
you will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb. He'll take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. The son, Samson, promised to Manoah's wife, is to be a very special child with a very special purpose. He will begin the deliverance of Israel from the Philistines, it says. And as such, the child is to be a Nazarite from birth. The word Nazarite means dedicated or consecrated. This child is to be dedicated and set apart for the Lord and His purposes. Now, a person could voluntarily take a Nazarite vow, but in Samson's case, he is a Nazarite throughout his entire life, even while he is in his mother's womb. There were three special restrictions that a Nazarite observed as part of this vow. He is to abstain from grapes, raisins, grape juice, any kind of fermented drink. His hair is not to be cut. And he's not to go near a dead body, either human or animal. Numbers chapter 6 talks about the Nazarite vow. If you're interested in reading more about that, we're not going to do that this morning. All of these restrictions were to always be a part of Samson's life from conception until the day of his death, it tells us in verse 7. And if we skip down to verse 24 of Judges 13, it says, The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Mahanadan between Zorah and Eshtal. Samson had every advantage as a child growing up. He had a great family with loving, godly, committed parents. They were dedicated to the Lord. They raised Samson in the way of the Lord. He had the special blessing of God on his life from conception onward. One would think that if anyone is going to turn out right, it would be Samson. Instead, Samson lives an out-of-control life. He lacks character and personal discipline. And this will bring tragedy into his life. Judges 14.1, it says, Samson went down to Timnah, he's an adult now, and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I've seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. Timnah had originally been an Israelite city, but it at this time is under Philistine occupation. And we get our first look at Samson's character here. He is very impulsive. He is directed and driven by his desires rather than his head. He has a weakness for beautiful women. He says here, get her for me. She's the right one for me. He hasn't even talked to this woman yet. He has only seen her, but he knows she's the right one for him. That actually sounds like the way many people pick their mates in our own day, though, isn't it? Normally in Israel, the parents decided who their children would marry. When Samson tells them about this young Philistine woman he's, he's seen, they try to talk him out of it. The Israelites were not supposed to intermarry with the surrounding peoples like the Philistines. But Samson is very persistent, and his parents, they finally give in to his wishes. But in verse 4, it says this. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines, for at that time they were ruling over Israel. This is one of the most intriguing verses in the Bible. This young man, Samson, he's driven by his own selfish desires, disrespectful of his parents, disrespectful of the commandments of God, disrespectful of the calling of God on his life, disrespectful of the Nazarite vow he's supposed to be observing, but in the process of him pursuing his own self-centered life, he accomplishes the will of God. 
This is a powerful statement about the sovereignty of God and how he works in the lives of people in spite of them, if need be. The Lord is going to use Samson's marriage to this Philistine woman to engage the Philistines in a fight. The Lord will use Samson's foolish behavior again and again to accomplish his will. Now that doesn't excuse Samson from his responsibility before God for his sin and his selfishness. But his sin and his selfishness are not going to thwart the will of God. How is that accomplished? I don't know. It's part of the mysterious wisdom and purposes of God, and I simply worship him for it. I'm so grateful because it's true in my life too, and it's true in your life, that I don't thwart God's ultimate will through my own sin and foolishness. He's bigger than all of it. When verse 5 of Judges 14, it says, Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. And as they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson. This is a phrase that we will see repeated several times in this story. Samson, he kills this lion with his bare hands, literally tearing it to pieces. Now, we might get the picture in our mind of Samson being this huge man, like a hulk. And it's his overwhelming size that gave him the advantage and ability to do his amazing feats of strength. But the text doesn't say he was extraordinary in size. In fact, in all likelihood, Samson was probably a very average-sized man who the Spirit of the Lord empowered to do amazing things. Can we turn our ringers off on our phones or whatever's going off? It's a distraction to other people, okay? So put it on silent, please. Judges 14, 7 says, Then he went down and talked with the woman, and he liked her. Samson, he meets the woman of his dreams for the first time, and he knows for sure that she's the right one for him after just a few words of conversation. Now, I just want to say to those of you who are not married right now, please don't use Samson's example for how to find a marriage partner. It's not a good example to follow. Verse 8, it says, Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass, and in it he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. He scooped out the honey with his hands and ate as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and they ate too. But he didn't tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. During the first visit mentioned in verse 7, the marriage was agreed upon, arrangements were initially started. Now Samson, he comes back for the wedding ceremony. And what's the problem here, though, with Samson eating this honey that came from the lion's carcass? And some of you are going, because it's grouse. That's, that wasn't the problem. The problem is that Samson is breaking his Nazarite vow. He's coming in contact with a dead body even eating honey out of this dead body. Verse 10, it says, Now his father went down to see the woman, and there Samson held a feast, as was customary for young men. When the people saw him, they chose 30 men to be his companions. These 30 companions that were provided for him are to be friends of the bridegroom for Samuel. And the word translated feast means literally a place of drinking, suggesting that in all likelihood, Samson has broken another part of his Nazarite vow, the prohibition against fermented drink. Verse 12. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can give me the answer within the seven days of the feast, I'll give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. 
If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Tell us your riddle, they said. Let's hear it. And he replied, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. For three days, they could not give the answer. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, coax your husband into explaining the riddle to us, or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Did you invite us here to steal our property? That's a pretty harsh threat that they lay on her, isn't it? But it says, then Samson's wife threw herself on him sobbing, you hate me. You don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. I haven't even explained it to my father and mother, he says. So why should I explain it to you? She cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her because she continued to press him. She, in turn, explained the riddle to her people. Before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town said to him, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And Samson said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. And we note here that Samson is quite a poet, a master of the language, is he not? I'm not sure how it played out in his day, but referring to your wife as a heifer in our day would probably not go over very well. Samson is very angry. He knows they've conspired with his wife to get the answer to his riddle. So in verse 19, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. There's that phrase again. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of everything, and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home, and Samson's wife was given to one of his companions who had attended him, who had attended him at the feast. Well, Samson has paid his debt off, but not quite the way we might expect. Ashkelon is a large Philistine city located about 20 miles further into Philistine territory. Angry with his wife, Samson, he decides to go home for a while to cool off, leaving her with her parents. And while he's gone, the bride's father gives her in marriage to Samson's Philistine best man. As you can guess, it's not going to go well when Samson finds out about that. In verse 1 of chapter 15, it says, Later on, at the time of wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. He said, I'm going to my wife's room. But her father would not let him in. I was so sure you hated her, he said, that I gave her to your companion. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. Samson said to them, This time I have a right to get even with the Philistines, I will really harm them. So he went out and he caught 300 foxes, tied them tail to tail in pairs. He then fastened a torch to every pair of tails, lit the torches and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and the standing grain together with the vineyards and olive groves. Now, obviously, we're not endorsing what he's done here with the foxes. It's, it's a Samson thing. It's, it's, you know, God is not saying, follow Samson's example. No. When the Philistines asked, who did this? They were told, Samson, the Timnite son-in-law, because his wife was given to his companion. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. Samson said to them, since you've acted like this, I swear that I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in a cave in the rock of Etam. So the conflict between Samson and the Philistines quickly enlarges to national proportions with a full-scale feud war taking place between them. After attacking the Philistines viciously, slaughtering many of them, he takes refuge in his cave back in Israelite territory. And it says, The Philistines went up and camped in Judah, spreading out near Lehi. And the people of Judah asked, 
Why have you come to fight us? We've come to take Samson prisoner, they answered, to do to him as he did to us. Then 3,000 men from Judah, these are Samson's own people, 3,000 of these guys, went down to the cave in the rock of Etam and said to Samson, Don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. And they said to him, We've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson says, Well, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed. We'll only tie you up and hand you over to them. We'll not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. It's a sad commentary on the state of the Israelite people at this time, that they are more willing to settle for cheap peace with the godless Philistines than to rally around Samson and fight alongside him. It's obvious that the Lord has raised Samson up as a deliverer for the people, but they have no stomach for the fight that they would have to face against the Philistines. They're cowardly and they're faithless. They would rather maintain the status quo, living under the thumb of the Philistines, than risk the pain and the suffering involved with a fight for their freedom. Don't just settle for survival in life. Live a life of faith, pursuing the call of the Lord on your life. Choose to go down fighting if need be, rather than slowly withering away as an empty, lifeless husk. Don't be like these cowardly men. Verse 14. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. There's that phrase again. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Then Samson said, here's that poet again, with a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. You should memorize that one. When he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was called Ramoth Lehi, which means hill of the jawbone. It appears that Samson has beaten the Philistines back And he will keep them more or less at bay now for the next 20 years. Samson is a very self-destructive person, though, and will be his own undoing, as we'll see in the next part of the story. In Judges 16, 1. (coughs) Excuse me. It says, one day Samson went to Gaza, where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, at dawn we'll kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Gaza was a city deep inside Philistine territory along the Mediterranean coast. Notice how notorious Samson is among the Philistines. They want to kill him in the worst way. He's enemy number one for them. But can you imagine the scene in the morning? Anyone see the city gates? They seem to be missing. Samson apparently carried the gates of the city more than 30 miles and put them on the top of a hill that overlooks the Israelite city of Hebron. Almost like a trophy, he like takes them up and he just sets them on top of the hill. Probably goes in here and goes, check it out. Why was Samson in Gaza to begin with? To spend time with a prostitute. He's a daredevil with no moral restraint. This kind of behavior, it's going to lead to his downfall. Verse 4 says, Sometime later he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. 
Dun, 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 dun. Here it comes. See, we know. Like, oh, Delilah. The ruler of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. This is a considerable amount of money that's being offered to her to betray Samson. And so Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. And Samson answered her, if anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I will become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she tied him with them. With men hiding in the room, she called them, Samson, the Philistines are upon you! But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, You have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. And he said, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then, with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, all this time you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. And he replied, if you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric on the loom and tighten it with the pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove wove them into the fabric and tightened it with the pin. And again, she called him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin, the loom, with the fabric. I kind of picture this loom hanging from his head. And then she said to him, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. He's getting progressively closer each time, isn't he, to revealing his secret. He likes toying with her and playing games. He likes taking risks. He's like that person who wants to get as close as they can to the edge of the cliff without falling. But it'll catch up to him. Verse 16, it says, With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, he's told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. And after putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. And then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison. Samson attributed his strength to his hair, but it was not really the uncut hair that gave him the supernatural strength. It was the Lord. And that's what he lost sight of a long time before Delilah cuts his hair off. Samson had toyed with sin his whole life. He had flagrantly ignored and violated the Nazarite vow again and again. And now his carelessness and arrogance finally catch up to him. 
He breaks the last remaining element of his Nazarite vow, and the Lord finally leaves him to reap what he's sown. His sin ends in tragic loss. And there's a sad irony in what happens to Samson here. He is put in the prison of Gaza. That's the same city that he had escaped from by tearing the city gates from their hinges. And he's forced to do the job of a donkey, pulling a grinding wheel, the same kind of animal whose jawbone he had used as a weapon years before to kill a thousand Philistine men. Toying with temptation is a dangerous game which can leave us blind and imprisoned. Verse 22 of Judges 16, it says, But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. This is my favorite verse of the whole story because it speaks of the grace of God. After living like a fool, squandering all of the good things that God put into his life, Samson has earned his life in this Philistine prison. He's getting exactly what he deserved. But the Lord extends grace to him and is going to give him another opportunity. His hair begins to grow again. It's a symbol of God's grace extended to Samuel. I mean to Samson. Verse 23 says, Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our, multiplied our slain. And while they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. And on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more. And let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against him. His right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. And thus he killed many more when he died. And while he lived, then his brothers and his father's whole family went down to get him. They brought him back and buried him between Zorah and Eshtal in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had led Israel 20 years. In closing, with his amazing strength, Samson was able to conquer virtually any foe. Ironically, the one person that he wasn't able to conquer or to control was himself. Aristotle said, self-control is the hardest victory. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.23. It's something God produces in us and causes us to grow in us as we walk with him, living our life in obedience to him. Jerry Bridges said, The beginning of self-mastery is to be mastered by Christ. Samson's story is a powerful reminder for us to not play with temptation. That we're never as strong as we think we are. It will catch up with us. Now there are a lot that could be said about Samson's life. There are many different aspects of his life that we could talk about. Many of the lessons that we can learn from Samson's life are obvious. But I want to end with this final thought. 
The life of Samson is a picture of the history of Israel. All Israel was to be a Nazarite, in a sense, a people dedicated and consecrated to the Lord their God. And with the presence of the Spirit of the Lord, they were undefeatable. This finds its most striking example in the life of Samson. Through a single person, the Lord subdued Israel's great enemy, the Philistines. See, God used 10,000 foot soldiers under Barak to defeat the huge, well-equipped army of the Canaanites. God then used a mere 300 men under Gideon, armed with nothing but trumpets and clay pots, to defeat 135,000 Midianite soldiers. And then with Samson, God used a single person to defeat the Philistines. Are you getting the picture? Who does victory really depend on? The size of our army? The skill of our army? The equipment of our army? No, it depends on the Lord. When they turned away from the Lord, their strength left them. They became as nothing before their enemies, who easily overran them and stole the blessings that the Lord had purposed for them. They became weak like any other person without the Lord. But the Lord is merciful, and he's full of compassion and grace. When the people turned back to the Lord, he again renewed their strength and again delivered them from their enemies. Samson's hair began to grow again after it had been shaved, and his strength was given back to him by God. And a similar story plays out in our lives. We're to be Nazarites in a sense, too, a people consecrated and set apart to the Lord. We're to be his people. And with the Lord, we're strong. We're carried through life, given strength to face every obstacle, given courage to fight against the enemies of our soul, filled with peace and joy, and given the opportunity to be a blessing to others. And without him, we are as nothing. We become as weak as any other person. There's nothing special about us. Uh, but with the Lord, very different because we're his people. Walk with the Lord. Walk with the Lord. He's the source of strength for our life. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the story of Samson. I mean, it's, it's a tragic story. And yet it's really not very far off the mark from our own stories. Lord, we, we are your people. Help us to live our life set apart to you, dedicated to you, committed to you, Lord. Fill our lives with the blessings that come with being your people when we're walking in fellowship with you, Lord. As you would make that so, remind us of your love, Lord. Father, we thank you so much for your grace that Samson's hair began to grow again. And his strength returned. Lord, when we turn back to you, our strength returns. The strength that you give us for life. May we all turn back to you, Lord, even now. And you strengthen our lives, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. As your people. In Jesus' name. Amen.